Billy Bragg travelled around Britain's mining communities to play benefit gigs to raise money for striking families. On the bill one night was a miner and songwriter who would have a profound effect on Bragg's career. On Radio 4 Now, he tells the story of Jock Purden, the miner's poet. This is the uh, latest banner from Harriton Corrie or Kosher Corrie, as it's known locally. At the top of the steps in the Washington Arts Centre in the northeast of England hangs a banner. It's a union banner of the type that has been held aloft at the head of rallies and marches for centuries. And uh, these are two of the stalwarts. Jack Elliott's my dad. Jock Purd was a great friend of ours and a songwriter. I know this banner. I sung in front of it when it was first unfurled in 2005. Pictured on it are two men sat before an old pit wheel, both of them miners in the Durham coal field. Every colliery had its own banner. It was a symbol of the solidarity of the pitmen. Brave, bold men of kosher, which is written there, was the title of one of Jock's songs. Unfold the caution banner, boys, where are the rebels bold? Let march behind the banner on gala days of old. It once was said that they were red like the skin I've been told. Jack Elliott, Doreen Henderson's dad, and Jock Purden are just two of the singers who have worked in the Durham coalfields, part of a rich tradition in this area of singing and poetry putting into words the lives and experiences of the people, working underground and living and surviving in pit communities. Well, I always say to them, because we take the banner out on Gala Day in July, and I always say to my dad, right, this is your first visit outside, and we're going to go in the pub and have a pint with it. Because he's still alive, to me, uh, his spirit's there, and the same with Jock, both gone but they're alive through the thinking and through the singing. They'll never die, I hope. The Durham coalfield powered the Industrial Revolution and there have been pits in this area for hundreds of years. Not now, though. This isn't a mining area anymore and there are few signs that it ever was. But at its height, it was producing millions of tonnes of coal every year. And around these pits grew new communities to service this industry. There are five main coal fields in Britain. One of the larger coal fields is Durham. And one of the larger Durham collieries is at Willington. If you're out there, walking along the lanes or the fields, or looking at Bransworth Castle, you come upon it suddenly over the brow of a hill. It was probably the first great coal field in the world. Robert Coles grew up in the area and is from a mining family. He's now a professor of history at De Montfort University in Leicester. Out of Newcastle and Sunderland, they were shipping half a million tonnes a year in the 17th century, a million tonnes in the 18th century, and by 1913, 56 million tonnes of coal was coming out of the northeast. And the point here is that you could have never had an industrial revolution in these islands without the ability of British coal miners to produce ample supplies of cheap, high-quality coal. Bulletin ...with a wider look at the coal strike and the effect it's having on the communities involved. With the stoppage now approaching its 11th week, miners have become hardened to living without pay. Savings have been spent, credit used to the limit, and a life of privation is now a familiar routine to more than 100,000 pit families in Britain. During the 1984 miners' strike, I went to the north of England to do gigs to support the mining communities. Doesn't want to care, doesn't want to care. But 1985, there's only one real question in people's minds as far as I'm concerned, and one decision to be made. Which side are you on? There was no way I could just stand aside and not take part in them, because as far as I was concerned, these were working class people, my people. I came from a heavily industrialised area where we built cars. And it seemed to me that what was happening to the miners was also happening at places like Fords at Dagenham. This government had an idea and Parliament made it law. It seems like it's illegal to fight for the union anymore. And which side are you on, boys? Which I arrived in the North East as a child of the punk rock period. I was been a Clash fan, they'd politicised me. And here I was bringing the truth to the mining communities. And of course, when I got up there, I found that there was Jock Purden 
singing these mining songs that were much, much more political than anything I had in my song bag. And it reminded me that in folk music there was an unbroken line of topical, traditional songs singing about the ordinary lives of working people. And it kind of helped to reconnect me with that tradition. The sense I got from playing on the same bill as Jock Purden was that here was a, a great working class tradition and that by standing up for the miners and standing with Jock and with those communities, I was joining that tradition. So when I came away, I went and found out as much as I could about it. Learned about songwriters like Joe Hill, learned some of Ewan McCall's songs. In many ways, Jock was the last of his generation of people who actually had been miners and were singing about it. Those who came after, they were singing the songs of their parents or the singing the songs of their area. It says here that the unions will never learn. It says here that the economy's on the upturn. The effect it had on my songwriting was to take me from someone who had written personal songs about politics, and that change was brought about by coming into contact with working class culture expressed by people like Jock Purden. This is Conyers Avenue, which is in South Pelor, uh, Chesley Street. Jock Purden was actually kind of George, and like most miners, he was given a nickname. Uh, and because he was from Glasgow, it was natural, if not original, that he became Jock. These houses, this is pretty much as me dad would have known it when he came here as a Bevan boy uh, in 1944. By the time Jock came of age, the Second World War had begun. His brother was sent away to fight in Europe. Jock, though, became a Bevin boy and was conscripted into the coal fields of Durham. He'd grown up surrounded by songs and music and he developed a love of Robert Burns. The trees that we see over here, those are the trees of uh, Lambton Park, which was the estate of the Earl of Durham. And in 1944, on that horizon, you would have seen the pulley wheels of two pit shafts, and that was the heapstead of Harriton Colliery, where me dad worked. The mine itself, it's disappeared under that housing estate, obliterated, you know. You would have to really know what you were looking at to see anything of the past here. Their claws and the pits down that light to the west. Times they are changing, they say for the best. New places to see and new people to meet. I'm sure they will rule even Chesterly Street. Chesterly Street stands near the weir, an old mining town that once brewed its own beer. There are two watches here that were important to me, Dad. That one is me Dad's pit watch. It has a rubber cover to keep the coal dust out. And as you see, it's not uh, a particularly fancy chain, but it, it did the business. The other watch is actually a stopwatch that he used as a folk singer. When he used to practice his songs, he needed to know how long the songs were going to take. His performances, they looked fairly natural, but a lot of effort on the technical side went into it. He always knew what songs he was going to sing. This is one of his little crib sheets. If he was going to sing uh, one evening, he would know the run of the songs that he was going to sing. He would also make notes about the manner in which the songs would be sung. Ye brave bold men of Kosha, the day is drawing and thus you'll have to change your banner, boys. This farewell to Kosha, that one came up quite often and he's put a note on the top there, which is in Pid dialect, and it says, give it laldi, sing it with some uh, spirit, with some force. You brave bold men of Kosher, to you I say farewell, and maybe someone will someday the Kosher story tell. Singing and reading, reciting, recitation, it was very much part of what people did at their own fireside. There was a miners' uh, pub near here called The Plough. They used to go up there on a Sunday night and there was a, a sing-around and everyone was kind of expected 
to stand up. That, I think, was probably the performance of some of his first mining pieces. Kosha was a colliery, her men were brave and bold. It's Thursday afternoon in the Beamish Mary pub, in a village called No Place, and a couple of regulars are nursing pints in the bar. In the back room, Jez Lowe and Benny Graham sit below posters advertising the folk club's open mic slot. Jez and Benny have been joined by Johnny Handel, all of them carrying on the tradition. When I finally came across him, he was a very well-dressed, very upright, elderly man, you know, and completely different from the generation that I was hanging out with to sing folk songs. But he was singing political stuff when, at a time when it, people weren't really singing political stuff on the folk scene. There'd been all that sort of 60s stuff had gone away and everybody was just singing traditional songs. And there was pit songs and there was left-leaning songs, but Jock was very political. And so it was a bit of an education for me, really, because I wasn't writing songs at the time, you know. But to hear somebody that looked like that but had those ideals and was willing to stand up and just sing about them, you know, it was quite an eye-opener for me. He obviously saw some affinity with me, with me dad being a pitman and everything, and then eventually, when he was going to record some songs, he asked me to play guitar on them, and then he asked Benny as well, and that's how we did that LP, which I think we started in about 1979 or something. Whatever Jock was, he was a writer, first and foremost, with a, an opinion that had to be expressed but not the world's most slick performer. So we kind of moulded him a little bit into, into the studio side of things, you know. When you seen the daily papers spewing out their lies Politicians promising pie in the sky Nobody listening to the union's cries I got the Joe Hill blues, all right he had lots of lyrics, great lyrics, you know, very stirring stuff, but he only had about three melodies. Half the album was to the tune of Come All Your Tramps and Hawkers. I think on the finished album there's still three songs with that tune. And he just thought this was hilarious, you know. We would say, no, Jock, you can't do that one. You know, it's, it's the same tune as the last one, we're going to have to do something different. And he didn't care, you know, it was the words, I think. Johnny Handel has been part of the music scene for decades, and he's an ex miner himself. I remember asking him about writing melodies because I was writing stuff and uh, I said to Chuck, did not fancy writing a, a different tune, he says. Oh, no, he says, uh, it's a waste of time, he says. I can spend more time thinking of the words. Setting off the missiles just to see them cruise I got the Joe Hill to lose all right I met Chuck first when I went to Berkeley Folk Song Club, which is south of Newcastle, and he was one of the people who got up and sang a song. And I particularly noticed whenever I was there, he always seemed to be writing a new song, and there were always political songs. And having been in the pits myself, I could identify with the themes in his material. So he was very active in, in a political way, but he's also creative, and he was always willing to get up and sing, not all songwriters are willing to do that and he was a member of the community that went to Berkeley Folk Song Club where most of the audience happened to be also performers. A wonderful thing. Berkeley Folk Club was the centre of this remarkably rich culture of folk singing that has stretched back centuries in this area. The head of the family was Jack Elliott who like Purden worked at the Kosher Pit. So rub it about me canny lad Wind it away, keep turning. The backshift man I've got in the end. They'll be back here in the morning. Doreen Henderson, Jack's daughter, ran the club until it was forced to close just before Christmas, after 52 years. Singing for her was part of life in the living rooms of the houses that surrounded the pits. We lived in one street of colliery houses, and that's all there was, a chapel and a pub and the street of houses, and we had our own entertainment, and it was always singing. We had booty concerts from me being five-year-old, and it was all music, it was all pit, it was all folk songs. They always sang in the pubs, always. I mean, 
When we got up to 12 or so, when you, you, you didn't get in the house early, we used to go and listen at the pubs, and we knew it was hoying out time, as they said, at 10 o'clock, when Jodie Dalton, the man four doors up from us, used to sing songs of the seas, bobbing up and down like this, mm -hmm. and we'd look through the window and there was all the pitmen bobbing up and down. <laughs> <laughs> like kids again, absolutely reborn. It was just fascinating. The music gave it an authenticity that was peculiar to the Pitmen because they were very musical. I don't know, they had choirs. If you went to the chapel, the chapels always had a choir. I don't know where the singing come from unless it was a form of relief. That's the only thing I can think of, that it was so different from what they were doing day after day, the grind down the pit. The music and the songs were just nectar to them. Rachel and Becky Unthank represent a new generation who are helping to keep the North East industrial song tradition alive. A lot of mining songs and a lot of political songs, we'll sing them at family gatherings and things like that because they're just songs that we're really familiar with, really because of the big influence of the Elliot's Club at Bertie. I think when my mum and dad moved from Teesside and that was the club that they found and were really welcomed into and, and enjoyed the crack and in the songs and the politics and those songs have definitely been the background to our growing up really yeah we just kind of soaked them up as kids and and sang them and i guess as we got older started to ask what they were about and a bit more about why people sung them and you learn things don't you by i think songs passing on stories and learning about where you come from and the, the area that you grew up in that's partly why we love those songs and i think like the elliot's like passion for these songs has always come across mm. like you know they really mean it when they sing it it's not just a story it, to them it's life and they still have that passion now when they sing and we enjoy singing these songs with them as well they were a big influence on us growing up just their passion of singing and, and the subject matters and it did have an impact even if we didn't realize it at the time to bank me canny lads wind her away keep turning the back shift men are gone in the am they'll be back here in the morning and when Jock heard and wrote some songs and he asked our dad to sing them Did and, he? My, and dad never got round to it he still got some tapes somewhere he said the other day he's got some tapes we'll remind him with some songs on it Jude Murphy has written about this culture of songwriting that grew in the Durham mining communities. There's a very distinct particularity to the northeast of England, and within that, you've got various really strong industries that grew up, such as the miners and also shipbuilding, although shipbuilding, funnily enough, doesn't produce as many songs. Then you've got the farmland, you've got all these different kinds of occupations all feeding into each other in this very distinct area with a very long history and there's still this sense of it being a Northumbrian identity, you know, going all the way back to Bede's time. An awful lot of that identity comes through in the songs and that dialect itself feeds into the class consciousness in the North East and the occupational identities. It's an unbroken tradition, I think is what we said before, and trace it right through. It's unique in the North East, in England. In Scotland it's the same, and in Ireland it's the same, you know, it's, but nowhere else in England really has this unbroken tradition. I think it's a little bit to do with isolation. There's a bit of a, a, a gap between the North East. It, it's not quite Scottish because it's just south of the border, and it's not quite England because it's just north of all the, the English things that go on. So it's a kind of borderland all of its own, and, and it has been. The, the borders were always lawless, you know, they, were, they, they didn't belong to anybody, and people are not frightened to express themselves. And I think once you get a bit further away, that's not the case, you know. They're a bit more worried about being part of uh, the, the other team down there, you know, where we ain't. Often enough, it's the spoken language comes first and then they would tie that to whatever music hall he was popular at the time. One of the most common tunes is um, Castles in the Air, which is basically the same tune as the Ball of Kirimur. Basically, four and twenty virgins came up from Inverness, you know, and they would use that for all kinds of subjects. So they're using these tunes, but then they're writing about what matters to them within their communities and often enough actually it's a print culture as well it's not necessarily always a culture where people just sing the songs and then they disappear into the ether we had very early broadsheet publishing here 
and lots of books were published right from the early 19th century sort of promoting people's songs and in that case they used as fundraisers and things as well when there's a strike sell a few ballad sheets and um, you help to raise money for the strikers and same for a disaster for the widows. Robert Coles is Professor of Cultural History at De Montfort University and has written a book called The Collier's Rant about singing in industrial communities, especially in his native northeast. Jock Purden and the Elliots were part of the second folk revival, so-called, in the 1950s and 1960s, which was strong in the northeast and particularly in the coalfield. I mean, the music of the labour movement is, of course, the brass band. I mean, there were about 5,000 brass bands in England in the 1930s, and some of the very best bands were in the northeast of England. And then, of course, there was a choral tradition too, more connected, I suppose, originally through the Methodist chapels. And then popular music, music sold for money and sang for money. And that's very apparent. Right from the 1840s, there's a great musical tradition there, singing in pubs and concert halls and, of course, later in music halls. Now, people like Jack Elliott were not immune from all this. They understood these other musics and these other traditions and mixed with them. This is not a, a guy who's constrained by the tradition but enabled by it. Come listen, no ye mine lads that tack the road in by. Music is very powerful, but it can't change the world. What it can do, though, is engender a sense of solidarity. If you're listening to someone singing about your community, you realise ultimately that you're not alone. And that power is underlined if that person singing is from your community. By standing up and singing songs about the miners in the accent and language of the Northeast, Jock Purden and the Elliots were representing their people. There is a contradiction, though. The miners' songs were often romantic or a lament or an elegy, but a lament for a dangerous, hard, dirty, uncertain life. The elegy isn't really for the danger. The elegy is for the comradeship that was born of the danger. The men missed each other. And don't forget either that the money was good. Miners were well paid, certainly from the end of the 19th century, compared to other working class groups. Their autonomy was high. The trade union and labour movement didn't exactly control the village or the colliery, but had huge influence on what happened there. And of course, the community was good as well. So the elegy was not really for the pit. It was for the men who made the pit. I think there were all kinds of men in the mines. There were the muscle and bone men, but there were all kinds. There were the chapels and the cooperative society, the choirs, the workers' education classes. What united them was the work, but they were very different people in, in very many respects who were Maras and, and worked Maras. As a student of Burns, it gave me dad the permission in a way. I was a miner, I was a docker, I was a railwayman between the wars. I raised a family... I would probably never have written Between the Wars were it not for the inspiration of Jock Purden. Finding him sitting there singing unaccompanied at that miner's benefit was almost like discovering Woody Guthrie, because Woody didn't learn those songs, he lived them, and Jock was the same. Down the ages, powerful political messages have been passed on from generation to generation in song, and Jez and Benny are keeping that alive here. He sat in this pub once with me, and we were talking about stuff. I think you were there, Benny. He says, Jez, he says, anarchy. Anarchy is the only way. And I was going, well, to joke, you know, a bit much. <laughs> but everything, this was about 1981 or 82, it was before the, the minus, that, that minus strike in the 80s, the big strike. I mean, he was writing songs, the coal being superseded by the, the oil, 
way back when cheap oil was on the go and people were changing from coal-powered central heating to oil-fired central heating. And he saw that as the thin end of the wedge for the coal industry in its entirety, and he was 100% right. It's minor this, it's minor that, it's minor dig the coal. But when the oil comes pouring in, it's minor on the dole. Whenever I thought of truck, I always thought, that's my little progle. I'll be guilty because I haven't dwelt enough on the political aspect of something. I'll be writing some smooth songs about jolly things and funny things that's happened. First straightforward song and suddenly I thought, I'm just getting to be a middle of a roader. I would think of Jock and think of his songs and suddenly I would have the inspiration to say, right, I'm going to do something because I felt like that and I'm going to stop everything. The chip pan can be burning, the band can have his nappy not changed. I'm going to start it. And once I've got the beginning of it, I'll think of Jock and I'll finish it. And you do it for yourself, but you also do it in memory of Jock. You've got to remember people and they stick up like mountains in the fog, you know. It's one of, well, well it's, at least, it's a snippet of, of one of Jock's songs. And he wrote it at the time of the 84 miners' strike. Who is that black leg mining man? Who is that black leg mining man? He's the one who helps the boss nail his brother to the cross. He is that black leg mining man. Where was that black leg? Jock's songs were truthful and singable. We always sang two or three of, of Jock's songs because they were. Universal. Some people would say, why do you sing songs about mining when you've clearly never done it? <laughs> um, I think because it had an effect on us hearing those songs and that passion and those stories, and especially because they're from the northeast where where we grew up and we just want to pass on those stories, really, and try and communicate them to others. My dad would have been disappointed if it all kind of came to an end and went on a shelf in some archive. You can sing a miner's song, but I think sympathising with it and understanding it, it is something to be genuinely proud of. I got this little brass plaque made, and it says George Jock Purden, 1925 to 1998. Bevan Boy, Colliery Putter, Shot Firer, Deputy Overman, Mines Rescue Worker, Poet, Songwriter and Folk Singer. You know, it's quite um, a set of words to have after your name. You know, it's, uh, you couldn't really look for anything more than that. Was deep down in the mine, gone through the picket line, where was that black leg mining man? Jez Law, Benny Graham and Johnny Handel bringing to an end Jock Purden, the miner's poet, which was presented by Billy Bragg. The producer in Salford was Richard McElroy.